Hello. So now we're ready to take a look at our second transit use case, which is shunt capacitor switching. And where you would typically see shunt capacitors would be for power factor correction. This is normally associated with improving voltage profile, say like on distribution feeders, and also reducing losses. But the fact is that it, when we switch these capacitors in, they also cause transits, which could create some power quality problems. So we're going to be looking at that in this particular lecture. Um, before I get into the material, uh, I just want to kind of mention that you might want to be considering the, the use of Python for doing some of this plotting in the class. I know a lot of you would be using MATLAB, but the problem you run into if you get a job in industry, the company you're working for may not have a MATLAB license. And so I generally encourage people to also learn something like Python or how to do some advanced plotting in Excel so that when you finally uh, do get a job in industry that you've got some tools that you've worked up in order to do you know, common types of engineering problems. So anyway, you could take a look at this later on. This is just an example of using Python for doing plotting. In this case, this is an RL fall example, kind of similar to what you'd have to do in homework number one. And what I'm doing in this case is I'm actually making use of this library um, called Matplot. And so this is actually a kind of a MATLAB emulation. In case you're familiar with using MATLAB, you can kind of do some of the same things in, in Python. So anyway, if you guys want to do this, uh, this is kind of some example code you can make a use of to kind of get started on this. So. What do these capacitor switching waveforms look like? Uh, this is actually a recording. I think this is actually on a 69 kV system. I don't believe the current scale is correct. I, I think the CT ratio wasn't plugged in properly. But what you see is you see some normal load current, and it kind of starts out somewhat in um, steady state, little some harmonics in there. But the, you can see when the capacitor switches in, what you can see is there's a kind of a high frequency inrush type of, of a transit. After a while it damps out because there's resistive damping in the circuit, but you see what's in su superimposed on the 60 hertz waveforms is a high frequency component. And what this is going to result in if I have some source impedance is I'm going to get an additional voltage drop across the source impedance due to that inrush current and what this is going to do this is going to show up in the voltage. And so it's going to tend to cause over voltages, it's going to tend to cause um, power quality problems. And what we're concerned with in this particular lecture is how we actually can quantify this, how we can actually model this. So as far as this phenomenon, um, we've kind of known that this has been happening. I mean, this has been talked about for a while, but it wasn't really until, you know, relatively recently, I guess, in the history of power engineering that we kind of knew exactly what was happening in the field. And this is from an early paper on taking field measurements around this. And this was done back, I, actually, you can see from the recording right here back in 94 with a device called a PQ node. Now before this we had no visibility of what was actually happening in the field especially at the distribution level and this was actually a project undertaken by Electric Power Research Institute to kind of start quantifying this and taking measurements. And so they developed a special type of recorder called a power quality node which could take voltage and current high frequency measurements and they put these at different locations on actual utility circuits. And this was a case where they were taking measurements of what was going on with uh, capacitor transits. And so this is actually a field recording right here, kind of similar to the one I had in the previous slide. But what you again see in here is you see kind of like this ringing waveform that's due to the capacitor switching on. You know, eventually this is going to damp out, but you're superimposing this high frequency. Uh, the range of these, um, you know, typically in the 300 to 1000 hertz range, I guess it could actually be higher, but this is typically the, the range that we see these capacitor switching transits. And again, what this does is because we have a source impedance involved, that it shows up in the voltage as, as well. 
So anyway, this is from an early paper um, from, from 90, uh, 96 era, as far as when this finally got published. Uh, another sort of interesting thing that was observed as well is some additional things that could happen as far as interaction between utility capacitors and, and customer capacitors. And so this is another um, paper by um, um, by these consultants that worked on this at the time. Mark McGranahan was working this area. Um, he, he's also now uh, the president of EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute. And this shows a circuit where you have a source impedance, so there's inductance here, there's a capacitance, then you have a line which has inductance, and then you have a customer that has a power factor correction capacitor bank as well. And so what's kind of interesting is when the utility capacitor bank switches in, that the effect is actually noted at the customer. So there's a transit voltage at the switch capacitor which kind of um, propagates to the customer level as, as far as a, a secondary transit as well. The reason you actually have this is actually there's two turns, two circuits. You have an LC combination that the utility would see and then you have an additional LC combination associated with the capacitor bank and what happens is energy gets coupled from the first capacitor into the second capacitor. So anyway this is just kind of gives you some ideas of what can happen when you have capacitors in the field. Not only could you have transits associated with the utility capacity, capacitor switching, which we're going to be focusing on here, but this could also propagate to capacitors that are actually located even on the, on the customer site. So the way I have this set up is I'm going to talk about in part A in this, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about kind of the theory behind this, and there's some type notes associated with this as well. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to work an example by hand, and I'm going to just go ahead and put this in a separate video. Then finally I'm going to take the results from that problem I worked by hand, and I'm going to replicate that with, with PSCAT, and that'll actually be a third video. So the simplest scenario as far as looking at the capacitor switching would be to start with let's just go ahead and ignore the resistance for now. And so a lot of times what this inductance would be would be the inductance associated say like with the substation that is associated with the switch capacitor. And so this is a combination of the transformer and the transmission system impedance, maybe a little bit of the distribution impedance. And so we have a source voltage which is sinusoidal. Uh, in this particular example, I'm assuming this has a form of square root of 2 times the VM, so that's a zero to peak value, times sine omega t plus theta, and the switching action is going to occur at time equals zero. So the point on wave is modeled by theta. Remember, the switching doesn't have to occur at a voltage zero crossing. It could, could occur at any point on wave of the source uh, voltage. We've also got a capacitor that we're switching into the circuit. And note this capacitor doesn't have to have a zero voltage across it. Keep in mind that at some point in time that capacitor is switched off and it turns, it turns out when you switch off a capacitor that there's typically going to be some trap charge on it. This thing is actually going to switch off at a zero crossing and so if that's going to be the case we're going to have some voltage across the capacitor. Now eventually that's going to discharge but in the time from when the capacitor switches off to when it gets switched back on again, it could still have some trap charge, or in other words, it could have some initial voltage across it. And so we have to model this. We have to model the fact that there's going to be some initial value of voltage. It doesn't have to be zero. And so if I write an equation, a loop equation for the circuit, I have the voltage across the inductance, LDIDT, plus the voltage across the capacitor, that's 1 over C times the integral of the current, plus this initial value for voltage, is going to be equal to the, the source voltage in this case. And so this is my Kirchhoff voltage law equation for the circuit in terms of solving for the current. So this form is not the form I need in order to solve a differential equation. What I want to do is I want to get rid of all the integrals. So what I do is I take the derivative of both sides of the equality, I divide through by L because I want to get 
a differential equation of the form where the highest order derivative has a coefficient of 1. And so I'm going to have the second derivative of the current with respect to time plus 1 over LC times the current is going to be equal to this term on the right, which is going to be the term of the form omega square root of 2 times Vm over L times cosine omega t plus theta. What happens when I take the derivative of the sine is what this gives me is omega cosine omega t plus theta. Okay, so taking the derivative of a sine gives me omega cosine. I have to also know the boundary conditions. In this particular case, I'm assuming there's no initial load on the circuit. So this means that this initial current uh, is going to be equal to zero. Right before and right after the switching action occurs, I have zero current because that inductor is going to resist any instantaneous changes, right? So because of the indu series inductance in the circuit, I, if I have zero current before the switching action, I'm going to have zero current immediately after. And what this does is this gives me this boundary condition that I0 is equal to zero. Now there's another boundary condition where, which we're going to need associated with the derivative of the current at time equals zero. And we know from the circuit that the voltage across this inductance is going to equate to the source voltage and the capacitor voltage at time zero. So another relationship which we could use is that the voltage across the inductor at time zero is equal to the source voltage at time zero minus the capacitor voltage at time zero. And so this is another boundary condition that we're going to need associated with the derivative of the current. And then we also know too that the voltage across the capacitor cannot change instantaneously. And so whatever voltage we had right before the switching action is the same as the voltage we're going to have right after the switching action. We could basically say this is going to be Vc at time zero then. So those are the two boundary conditions which we're, we're going to make use of. So how do I do the calculation for the current? Well, I'm going to break that up into two parts. There's going to be a steady state portion and there's going to be a transit portion. And the steady state portion is due to the sinusoidal forcing function, which we can calculate using phasor analysis. So in steady state, I could take the phasor voltage and I can divide through by the net complex impedance. This complex impedance is one over, sorry, is, is the complex impedance is J omega L plus one over J omega C, all right? So I can factor out the J in the denominator here. Note in this case is I'm writing this in terms of the RMS voltage, but you could do this in terms of the zero to peak voltage. And the J is gonna translate to having minus nine degrees in the numerator, and so I'm gonna have a a uh, real value for the denominator in this case. And so when I translate that back to the time domain, I'm putting in the square root of 2 to get that back to 0 to peak. Um, I have a minus 9 degree phase shift, and so before where I had a sign for the source wave form um, for the solution in this case, now I'm going to get additional phase shift of minus 9 degrees. And if I want to, I can take advantage of the fact from a trig identity that we have sine of minus nine degrees and that's going to translate to a to a cosine. So anyway, this is going to give me the the form, I'm sorry, minus a cosine. And so this is going to give me the form of the of the um, steady state current in the time domain. So now that I've got the sinusoidal portion of this, then what I can do next is I can solve for the transit part. Uh, I'm going to have to solve the homogeneous equation where basically I just set the forcing function equal zero. And so I'm going to have the second derivative of the current plus one over LC times I equal to zero. Basically just take that source and set it to zero. To, to solve for this, I need the characteristic equation. So basically uh, di dt is going to correspond to an, an S, the second derivative of the current this is going to correspond to S squared. And so what I'm going to have here is S squared plus 1 over LC equal to 0. And this time when I solve for the roots, what we're going to see here is these roots have to be imaginary. 
because we have S squared equal to minus 1 over LC in order to get this to work out, um, the roots are going to have to be complex. And they're going to be of the form where the first root is going to be plus J times 1 over the square root of LC, and the second root is going to be minus J um, times 1 over the square root of LC. And so basically, um, they're kind of complex conjugates of each other in this case. So whenever we have a situation where you have complex roots, if you have complex roots uh, for something of the form of e to the s, what this is going to do, this is going to give you a sinusoid. And we, we talked about this a little bit in lecture one, where the transit is going to have the form of a1 cosine omega naught t plus a2 sine omega naught t, where this frequency, this transit frequency, is going to be 1 over the square root of LC. And so basically, the way you can think about this is this transit is going to be a high frequency ringing component superimposed on top of the fundamental, say like the 60 or 50 hertz. And so to get the total solution, we add both these together. So we're going to have the steady state portion of this. We're going to have the transit portion. And then what we need to do is we need to to do the method of undetermined coefficients to find out what a1 and a2 are going to be. So anyway, we apply the boundary conditions. You set i0 equal to 0, and you basically figure out what a1 and a2 are. Uh, note in this case, if time's equal to 0, the sign term disappears. And so this gives us the ability of solving for what a1 is. And so we can get an equation for a1 that's shown right here. And then to get A2, what I need to do is I need to take the derivative of the current. So when I take the derivative of the current, then um, basically what I'm going to have is I'm going to have two terms. I'll have a fundamental frequency term and I'll have a transit frequency term. For the, uh, the current, when you take the derivative with respect to time for the sinusoidal part, what this does is it basically, this cosine, when I take the derivative, is going to give me um, um, minus omega times a sine. Um, when I take the derivative, we said in this case, um, you know, we figured out what um, A1 was going to be, but basically what we're going to get here for the cosine and sine is we're going to get minus omega naught times a sine, and for the sine taking the derivative, I get omega naught times the cosine. And so you have to kind of know your, your trig identities in this case and basically what the derivatives correspond to. But then when you plug in for time equal to zero, then di dt at time equals zero, well, we just simply set all these values for t equal to zero in this case. Uh, what we see in this particular expression is this term right here is going to go to zero. This particular right term here is going to be one. And so di dt at zero is square root to vm times omega divided by omega l minus one over omega c times sine theta. So this is going to be at the fundamental frequency plus a2 times omega naught. And we said before that this derivative of the current at time equals zero is this voltage at time zero for the source minus the capacitor voltage at time zero divided by L. And so we could use this right here to solve for A2. A2 is a rather complicated expression right here. Um, but then what we're going to have as a result of this is we'll have an expression for the current as a function of time. So anyway, later on we'll simplify this, but if you were going to want to explicitly model the source voltage at 60 hertz or 50 hertz. Um, this is what it would take. So anyway, this is the final form of the solution. Pretty, pretty complicated. But what we're going to do is we're going to simplify this by assuming that omega naught, which is this transit frequency, is going to be much higher than the fundamental frequency. Basically, as we look at that high frequency ringing transit, the source voltage isn't really going to change too much. So it's almost like what we're doing is we're kind of assuming that the forcing function is going to be DC. Um, that is, it's not going to change much as the transit's going to ring at a high frequency. 
And so anyway, this is a pretty reasonable assumption as far as getting a worst case effect as far as determining what kind of stress we're going to have on our components to do this capacitor switching. So how is this going to simplify the analysis? Well, basically, it's almost like you're setting the fundamental frequency equal to zero. And so now the right-hand side of the equality is square root of 2 Vm times sine theta. Theta is still needed because we still have the point of wave to consider, but now we're just assuming that the source is basically DC. So if you take the derivative of both sides to simplify this, you see basically that the source voltage disappears. All we have to solve for in this case is just a transit portion of the solution. The steady state portion is just simply going to be zero. And so the total solution of the current is basically the same as the transit part. So again, we apply the boundary conditions. Initial current is equal to zero. Um, basically, we have di dt, which is equal to the source voltage times zero minus vc at time zero divided by L. And if you go to this particular expression and you take the derivative, really all we need to worry about is the second term that sine omega naught t goes to, we take the derivative, it goes to omega naught times cosine. The cosine at time zero is going to be one, so we just simply have this omega naught times a2 on the right hand side. And then we can go through, we can calculate what a1 is, we can calculate what a2 is. Um, so a1 is going to be zero, and a2, when you do some of the manipulation on this, um, before, if you take this omega naught times L and you substitute in for 1 over the square root of LC, you see that A2 is given by this difference in voltages divided by this term square root of L over C. So if you put this back into the expression for current, what you see is this transit current we're going to have is going to be dependent on the difference in the voltages. This is basically this is basically the voltage you're going to have across the switch when the capacitor is switched on. The source voltage at time zero minus the capacitor voltage at time zero. Divided through by this term square root of L over C times sine omega naught times T, where this square root of L over C has units of impedance. And this term is used so often it has a special name, and this is called the surge impedance. So the amount of current you're going to get is going to be dependent on that difference in voltages divided by that surge impedance. All right. And what this expression uh, does, it gives you some ideas about how we can potentially minimize that transit current due to capacitor switching. One thing we could do is we can switch the capacitor on where that difference in voltages in the numerator is equal to zero. So that would be one type of solution. Or something else we could do right here is we can play around with the surge impedance um, as well. Um, but so, so there's a number of different things we could do um, to minimize the, the switching transit effect. All right, and that's talked about here. So if, if I'm gonna go ahead and try to get the switching to occur when the source voltage matches up the capacitor voltage, and that's something we refer to as synchronous switching. There's actually special types of capacitor switches that actually monitor the voltage across the switch contacts and won't close that in until the voltage differential is close to zero. We can also put a resistance in series. We'll, we'll see later on what the effect of adding series resistance is. We can have a higher surge impedance. Another thing we could also do too is we could put a surge arrestor device across that capacitor, and we'll talk about this at the end of the transits material, where basically this is a nonlinear device which is going to short out in order to save that capacitor keep to having too high a voltage across it. And so that would be another sort of action we could take is we could put a surge suppressor in the circuit. So what does the customer see? Well, what the customer is going to see is basically what voltage we have across that capacitor, right? And that's why we end up having to calculate the capacitor voltage. Because then if we have a ringing transit, then basically what we have to make sure of is that this ringing transit 
is is not going to cause any problems at the customer site say burn out pieces of equipment so other loads will actually be in parallel with the capacitor finally then what we would need to do is we would need to convert this current into a voltage expression in order to see what the impact on the customer would be and so capacitor voltage you take the integral of the current you add the initial voltage to it um, you're going to take this integral from 0 to T and so if I plug in for the current if I take the integral then what I have to evaluate is this particular expression here at T and then I have to subtract off the solution at zero, add to that the initial capacitor voltage. And what this simplifies to is it simplifies to a voltage term where this is going to be equal to the source voltage at time zero minus a sinusoidal term minus a term that has as its magnitude source voltage minus the initial capacitor voltage times cosine omega naught t. All right. So we could see here from this particular formula what would be the, the, the stress across this particular device if we looked at different initial values of source voltage. We looked at various values of capacitor voltage, initial capacitor voltage. That would actually tell us what the worst case stress would be across say like a customer load component. So what would be the worst case? Well it turns out that the worst case is going to be when the capacitor is charged up to the negative of the source voltage in the time we look at is omega naught t equal to pi. So why is that going to be the case? Well if that's going to be the case then cosine that sinusoidal portion of the, of the result, um, this is going to be at minus 1. And if we set it up in a way where that capacitor is charged up to negative the source voltage, and this particular term right here is going to be minus um, Vs, and what we see is we, if we substitute in for this particular case, that we're basically going to be getting a tripling effect that this peak voltage could actually start out at minus the source voltage and actually kind of jet up to three times that source voltage at, at time zero. And so if we're not really careful, you know, we could actually see this, this tripling effect in voltage. That voltage could actually get really high. Now, is this really going to happen in practice? Probably not, because there's going to be damping in the circuit, there's going to be surge arresters out there. Maybe the insulation would even break down. But all I'm saying here is in a perfect LC circuit, if there's no damping, and if we didn't have to worry about insulation failing, um, we could actually get that voltage to jump up to a pretty high value. So this is, this is a pretty dramatic effect um, in the worst case as we're looking at capacitor switching. What happens if we add some series resistance? What's going to happen is we're going to get some damping, obviously. And so this would be what we would get if the source impedance had some resistance. If the source impedance doesn't have resistance, sometimes we just intentionally add this through the use of what's called a pre-insertion resistor. So how this changes the solution, let's again assume that the source is going to have um, just basically the, a DC um, voltage as a model, then I can add the voltage across the resistance in this case, so I add this value of Ri, and when I take the derivative of both sides, this term goes to zero, and then we have the second derivative of the current plus R over L times di dt plus one over LC i is equal to zero. So basically this term gets added in. And what I need to solve for now for the characteristics of the equation is going to be this expression. Uh, it has this additional term of R over L times S in it. When I solve for the roots, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a quadratic equation. Uh, basically, if you have something of the form of AS squared plus BS plus C equal to zero, um, A is equal to one, B is R over L, C is equal to one over LC, and if I want to solve for the roots, this is minus B over 2A plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 
2A, right? And there's a, three different cases associated with this as far as the solution that we could have for the roots. We could have what's called an overdamped case where these roots are real. We could have a critical damped case um, and we can have an underdamped case. Typically what we're going to see, unless we add a lot of resistance, we're typically going to see an underdamped case where the roots are going to be complex. So there'll be a real part and there'll be a complex imaginary part. So in this likely scenario where it's underdamped, then we're going to have two roots. The real part's going to be negative, minus r over 2l. Um, this is going to be the form of the imaginary part. Um, and then the form's going to be alpha plus or minus j omega 1, where this is the result for alpha, the real part, and this is the result right here for the imaginary part. And note that this omega 1 is not going to be 1 over the square root of LC anymore. It gets detuned a little bit due to the resistance in the circuit. Not very much, typically. It's still going to be pretty close to omega naught, but it's, the, it's going to get detuned a little bit. So then when we have the expression for current, current's going to be C1 e to the S1t plus C2 um, to the power of S2t. We plug in for S1 and S2, they're going to be complex. And it turns out if you do the math on this, that the current's going to have an exponential part times the A1 cosine omega 1t plus the A2 sine omega 1t. So now we have an exponential in front of this. And if this exponential has a negative real part, then basically this is going to be giving us a sinusoid that's going to decay out with time before it just kind of lasts but forever. Now it's going to decay out with time. Where this omega-1 is a little bit different than omega-0. So if you wanted to substitute in here for omega-0, you could do this. I mean, this would be kind of an alternate expression for omega-1. But anyway, this is what we're going to get now for the form of the solution. And now we have to figure out what, what A1 and A2 are. So again, we use these same boundary conditions. The initial current zero, this is going to be the form of the derivative of the current times zero. Um, I can substitute in for time equals zero, and I can find out that A1 is equal to zero. And so I just have to basically figure out what A2 is. And now this is a little bit more complex, because now when I take the derivative of this current, I've got two different parts of it that are functions of time. And so what I need to do in order to take this derivative, I have to use what's called the chain rule. If you have two expressions, f and g, and you want to take the derivative of current, then you have to basically take the derivative of f first, multiply that by g. Then what you do is you take f and multiply by the derivative of g. And this is actually then how you would get the form of the, the current in this case. And so if I apply this here, uh, apply the chain rule, I've got to worry about taking the derivative of the exponential first. And the second part, I take the derivative of the, of the sine term. Gives me omega times cosine. Set, every, set time equal to zero. And eventually what I can do is I can figure out the expression for A2 where A2 is just simply going to be this derivative of the current divided by omega 1, all right? So now I get this particular expression for the current. Um, what's changed in this particular case? Well, the only thing that's kind of changed in this particular case is they have a slightly different value for the, the oscillating frequency. And then I have this exponential damping in here. So now, instead of just oscillating forever, it, it damps out with time. This is what we refer to as an exponentially decaying sinusoid. All right. So a lot more complicated than the, the RL circuit than the first order case. When we have second order circuits, these are just a lot more complicated to solve. And this is typically the extent we do these by hand is, is up to the second order then. All right. Um, there's also an overdamp case. I'm, really not going to go through this because we don't really see this unless we add a lot of resistance to the circuit. But you could actually set this up where you don't get any 
ringing transit at all. I mean, you could just simply get a decaying DC offset, it, I mean, a decaying exponential offset if you want. All right. So in the next videos, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work an example by hand and just show you some numbers associated with this and how you can actually do these calculations. And what I'm going to do is assume you have an initial capacitor voltage of 1,000 volts. So in the worst case, this would actually start out at whatever we can get with uh, a 12.47 kV source. It would eventually uh, decay out, though, after a period of time. These power factor correction capacitors typically have some built-in resistance to kind of drain the charge for safety reasons. And so this would initially decay after a while. Um, but so we're assuming this decays down to 1,000 volts. And what we want to figure out in this particular case is what's going to be the um, capacitor voltage if we energize it negative the source peak. I'm also going to do a, a little bit of a video on doing this in PSCAD where we're going to have this circuit right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically verify what we did by hand in working with this particular circuit right here. But I'll talk a little bit about how we would set this up and what the timings and everything would have to be in order to um, get this PSCAD to match out. And what we're going to see basically is in the base case, if I don't have any resistance in the circuit, what's going to happen is this higher frequency transit's basically going to ring forever. Now in this case what I'm doing is I'm modeling the source as, a, as an AC source. I'm not using a DC approximation. And so what you see is you see this high frequency transit superimposed on top of 60 hertz. Uh, if I add a little bit of source resistance in here, what happens is this starts to decay with time. And so this will kind of show you what the effect of the damping in the circuit's going to be. And then I also um, do something with a pre-insertion resistor where right? I purposely add some resistance into the circuit to damp out the transit. The way you would actually see this in the field would be when you have a circuit breaker, instead of just kind of closing the circuit breaker right away, you can actually put in a, what's called a pre-insertion resistor for a short period of time. And so this kind of serves to kind of cut down the transit. And then what you do is once the transit's been kind of attenuated, then you take that pre-insertion resistor out of the circuit. So this is kind of a trick we, we use in switching circuits um, is we actually purposely add a little bit of resistance in there to cause the, the uh, transit to decay faster. And then what you can actually do in PSCAD is in the circuit breaker model, you could actually specify that you want this pre-insertion resistance in there. So anyway, as far as references, um, you know, there's a few sections in the Greenwood book on capacitor switching. I also got uh, some notes that I worked up a while ago on capacitor switching, kind of equivalent to what's in Greenwood, um, but a little bit more condensed. And then Shankman, you know, talks about doing RLC type circuit analysis. So if you're looking for another reference, um, I kind of suggest the Shankman book as well. All right. Um, finally, one other reference that I just included in here and so we talked about there's power quality issues associated with these switch capacitors. And so this particular reference kind of gets into utility concerns. Uh, and this is why we have capacitors on circuit for power factor correction. We don't want to be switching these in and out that much, right? So if we're just kind of switching these in and out a couple times a day, that's fine. But if we have power factor correction capacitors, we don't want to be switching these devices out every 15 minutes because there are transits associated with these and depending on the system conditions when the switching occurs, you could actually cause some problems with your customers. And so um, just have to be kind of careful when you have these power factor correction capacitors in the field that we just simply don't overuse them because they're gonna cause some power quality problems. All right, so um, let me go to the next video when I'll, I'll continue the discussion in the other videos. Then.